Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship this morning on this sixth Sunday following Easter here at National City Christian Church. My name is Amy Butler. I'm the interim senior minister, and it's my joy to welcome you to worship today. Even as we cannot be together physically, I hope you feel the warmth of this community communicated through your computer or your iPad or however you're watching this morning. In a few moments, we'll be able to share the peace in the comments, but before we begin, we know that there are many of you who are joining us for worship from places outside of Washington, D.C. Wonder if you would take a moment to put in the comments on Facebook or YouTube where you're watching from. And of course, all of you are welcome to this place and to this time of worship. I hope that you feel the presence of God's Spirit as we open our eyes wide to look for resurrection. Welcome to worship. Please join me in our call to worship. Here today, there is love freely available to all. Not our human loving, fragile and intermittent, but God's supreme love. May a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth break forth into joyous songs of praise. Here today is love, higher than our loftiest hopes, deeper than the immensities of time and space, God's inclusive love. Let the seas roar their praise and everything in them. Let the rivers clap their hands and the hills sing together their happiness. Let us worship God together. Let us pray. Holy and mysterious lover of the world, let this day be a worthy celebration of our Lord's resurrection love. By the Easter good news, encourage us to put away our worries and to discard our fears, that with minds open to your spirit, we may better love you and more adequately worship your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our living brother and Lord. Amen. We are in the church season of Easter, and we are looking for signs of resurrection everywhere. When Jesus himself was resurrected and appeared to his disciples, he greeted them with a sign of peace. As we continue to keep our eyes wide open to the possibility of resurrection, let us begin worship this morning by sharing with each other the same peace that Christ offers. Leave a comment on Facebook or YouTube, or turn to someone you might be sitting next to on the couch. And the peace of the Lord be with you.
lesson is taken from the 10th chapter of Acts, beginning at the 44th verse. And the scripture reads, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing this, these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Amen. I'll be reading from John 15, 9 through 17 from the New Revised Standard Version Bible. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I have chosen you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask of him. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. Amen and amen. It's not the Bible that makes our job so hard, it's the notes. That's what a colleague of mine said recently when we were discussing how we talk to our congregations about reading the Bible. Well, I'm not sure I completely agree. There are plenty of troublesome things in the Bible itself that make our jobs hard. I do know what she meant. 
What she meant when she said the notes were all the parts on the pages in your Bible that are printed generally in italics, below a line on the bottom of each page of your Bible. If you have one sitting nearby, open it up and you'll see what I mean. Depending on the translation, version, and printing of your particular Bible, you might have whole paragraphs of notes, commentary, explanation, or at the very least, section titles delineating each new subject or story. I know what the publishers are thinking when they produce Bibles with notes. They're thinking that people like you and me sometimes have a hard time making sense of this ancient text, and we could use some helpful explanation as we read. The problem, of course, is that we readers have a hard time remembering which of the words are Holy Scripture and which are the comments of an editor who is just trying to be helpful. I remembered this when I ran into a disagreement with the notes in my Bible just this week. As usual, I started sermon preparation by reading the assigned passage. You heard it. It's a little snippet of four verses from the end of Acts chapter 10. It talks about Peter speaking and the Holy Spirit arriving and everybody being amazed when foreigners were included. It's a passage that made me think, hmm... There must be more to this story. So I went back and started reading at the beginning of chapter 10. The Bible I was using to study had a little italicized heading at the top of the chapter that read, The Conversion of Cornelius. I checked a couple of other Bibles on my shelf, and sure enough, there was a designation several times, The Conversion of Cornelius, or The Conversion of the Gentiles. Well, I was kind of bothered by this little note because the more I studied this amazing story from the book of Acts, the more I realized this is not the story of the conversion of Cornelius at all. This is the story of the conversion of Simon Peter. Well, the editors couldn't put that into the notes. After all, Peter was one of the first disciples that Jesus called to follow him. By the time Acts was written, Peter had been a converted follower of Jesus for many, many years. In fact, by the time Luke got to recording Acts, the account of the church's birth, Peter was one of the most highly regarded leaders in the church. There was presumably no need for him to be converted, but here he is again right here in Acts chapter 10, taken hold by the Spirit of God and all of the sudden coming to terms with a fundamental change in the way he saw life as he knew it. Peter is living right here in Acts chapter 10, a massive directional change requiring repentance and a new way of looking at the world. And that miraculous story is the setting in which our four verses from the book of Acts take place today. A reminder that sometimes being on the inside, being the comfortable ones, makes it impossible for us to see where God is at work. We have to open our eyes to recognize resurrection, to be converted, you could say, like Peter. In this passage, you should be aware that there are some church politics going on behind the scenes. Conflict in a church? No. There had been some serious dissension in the early church. It was a schism that divided two camps that each felt deeply convicted that their position was the right one. One camp, led by the Apostle Paul, was of the opinion that the gospel message should be proclaimed to the whole world, not just in Jerusalem and the surrounding regions where Jesus preached and lived, but the whole world. In other words, even including Gentiles, non-Jews. Well, this was shocking and a little bit scandalous. Leading the other camp was the Apostle Simon Peter, the main character in the story today. Peter was convinced, if you decided you believed in Jesus, the first step you would take, of course, 
was to convert to Judaism. You'd go through all the rites of Jewish identity and assume an upright Jewish lifestyle with all the dietary restrictions and Levitical rules and become a Jew. Well, this controversy, this schism is the backdrop for the amazing story that leads up to our passage this morning. Your Bible's editor might have called this passage the conversion of Cornelius. But look closely at the story before you decide to believe the notes. A principal in this story is Cornelius. He's a centurion of the Italian cohort, which means nothing to you and me today. But this is what it meant. Cornelius was an extremely high-ranking official in the Roman army, about as far from Peter as you could imagine. Cornelius wasn't a Jew. He had no interest in becoming a Jew. In fact, converting to Judaism was grounds for immediate dismissal from the army. But he's described here in our text as a devout man who feared God. And one day, as he was praying, he heard God's voice telling him to search out a man called Simon Peter. So he did. Meanwhile, back at the seashore, Simon Peter was staying at the house of a friend, and he went up on the roof, as was his custom, for his daily prayer time. Peter also had a vision, but this was a little stranger than Cornelius's. Peter, devout Jew and committed follower of Jesus Christ, saw a sheet floating down from heaven. And on the sheet were all kinds of animals, even animals that were clearly named in the Jewish Levitical code as unclean. The voice Peter heard in his vision told him to kill and eat the animals provided to him for food. Well, you can imagine how shocking this was. No way was Peter going to breach Jewish law to do something he has learned his entire life is unclean and forbidden. Peter knew there were standards for faithful, holy living. He could recite them from front to back. But then Peter heard the voice again, and this time he knew it was God. God had stern words for poor Peter, and they were. What God has called clean, you must not call profane. I think that sometimes those of us committed to tradition and institution end up in a similar place to Peter. We know the rules. We've followed the rules until they became traditions for a long, long time. And for most of the time, that has worked just fine. Up until the middle of the last century, for example, institutional religion in America was a booming endeavor. Church was the pillar of our social structure. Membership was a mark of character. The church was a stable and influential force in many lives. But about 70 years ago, something began to change. At first, the change was slight. But even after it wasn't slight, we church folk did a great job of ignoring the trends that were happening throughout the church. As we watched the decline of the institution, we agreed that something should be done. So we tweaked a few things here and there, added the occasional drum set, got a coffee bar, finally, grudgingly, put a website up, things like that. But as you know, the trend has gotten even more real. Gallup just recently reported that Americans' membership in houses of worship continued to decline last year, dropping below 50% for the first time in Gallup's eight-decade trend following. In 2020, for example, 47% of Americans say they belong to a church. In 1999, it was 70%. And even if we don't know the exact numbers, we do know that tweaking the way we've always done things isn't ever going to get us back to what church looked like in 1955, right? And so we resort to the things that humans always do when change is on the horizon. We clamp down. We grab tighter. We animate our shared life with fear. We know who's in 
and we definitely know who's out. And we predictably keep shrinking. Perhaps one of these days we will be willing to recognize that we have truly nothing to lose instead of boundaries and rules, obligation and tradition that squeeze the noose tighter and tighter around our institutional life. I wonder what would happen if we opened our eyes and looked around for signs of resurrection, no matter what they were. If we did, we might see our faith and its practice in wholly new, totally unconventional ways. And in so doing, we would fling those doors wide open, living like we believe the gospel message of love and justice is a message that is offered to everyone, every single person, as it was always meant to be. It sounds radical, but ironically, this is one of the most orthodox Christian places to land. Jesus, as you know, was a radical includer. Could we move past our desire to stay safely within, spending our time clarifying who is on the outside and hanging tight to what seems familiar? It's going to be hard. Turns out that Peter had the same exact dilemma. While Peter was still puzzling over the vision he'd seen, who showed up on his doorstep but representatives of Cornelius with the news that their master had sent them because he'd heard from God that they, Peter and Cornelius, should meet. Oh, this must have been so hard for Peter. And it wasn't just because Peter was a good-for-nothing bigot who couldn't overcome his prejudice. He wasn't. It was hard because everything that Peter had learned about God and about relationship with God was suddenly being challenged, turned on its head. And it wasn't just his personal opinion that was being called into question. The standards of holy living that Peter endorsed could be substantiated in Hebrew scripture and Levitical law. He knew from tradition that he should never interact with Gentiles. He learned his whole life at the feet of the rabbis in the synagogue that any sort of mixing with non-Jews was absolutely abhorrent to God. This wasn't just a whim for him. It was fundamental to his understanding of who God was. But convinced as he was of his beliefs, Peter had a heart that's ultimate desire was to follow God. And somewhere in the confusing message of the dream and the ensuing invitation from Cornelius, you have to believe that Peter realized. Come to think of it, Jesus had challenging messages like this for us all the time. And maybe, just maybe, Peter understood that God was asking him to look at the world, to look at his faith again in a whole new light, just like Jesus had always challenged him to do. So Peter, to his eternal credit, took the challenge of conversion that God offered him that day. He heard the voice in a dream and imagined what letting go of his cut and dried convictions of who God is would mean for his life. He took the risk of listening to the ever speaking voice of God and stepping into the fear of conversion. And as he did, he met Cornelius and decided that including him did not go against God's standards. In fact, Peter's conversion made him shockingly realize that his attitude of exclusion was the very thing that didn't meet God's standards. He says in verse 28, you yourselves know it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. Peter came to suddenly see that this was really the exacting standard that God required of him. And Peter, well, Peter converted. Ah, Peter, Peter. 
I feel your pain and ambivalence. I grew up knowing without a doubt what was wrong and what was right. I learned that God was an exacting God who expected a certain kind of life from me, a life that was clearly delineated at church. And I knew that missing the boat, that not meeting these standards meant certain destruction. And I learned my best how to live my life trying to do everything right. But then, like Peter, and like all of us, I was offered the opportunity for conversion. Not by lowering the standards that God expects for me, but by opening my heart to the possibility that God's love is wider and stronger, bigger and more embracing than I ever imagined. My conversion started with the realization that when I hold on to what I'm sure I know about God, my hands end up clenched hard and tight, knuckles white, muscles straining. When I was converted, I learned that there were indeed certain standards for relationship with the God of the universe, the standards of living our lives, doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly with God, or as Jesus said, loving God and loving my neighbor. In my conversion, I learned that God's high standards were not in any way dependent on my grip. Instead, my closed and tightly held fists were just that. Closed. Closed off to the fresh wind of God's spirit. Shut off from the work that God still had to do in my heart. Exclusive and small, gripping just a little piece of God's all-encompassing love for the whole world. Once Peter finally got that message, well, then the events in our verses today took place. He began to tell his friends and family and fellow community members of this new perspective he'd gained. And one day, as he was telling it, the Holy Spirit showed up in a similar way to the day of Pentecost. The Jewish believers were astounded, the text says, that God came even to those who were Gentiles, foreigners who were never Jews to begin with. All around them, they suddenly recognized so many others as siblings, as children of God, just like they were. I wonder what would happen to us if we began to be the church with eyes wide open, scanning the horizon for any hint of resurrection, ready to embrace it. We learn then what Peter did, that God is bigger than our qualifications, that God offers you and me the possibility of conversion as we constantly learn to open our hands and let go of what we thought we knew. Let go so the Spirit of God can create something new. Let go so we can recognize certain standards of faith in people we'd never imagined could believe. Let go, so that, like Peter, our hearts can be converted again and again and again. Today we're being asked to open our eyes wide to recognize those qualities of faith in the most unlikely places and to open our hands and our hearts to conversion so that we might believe in resurrection with our very lives, living out the radically inclusive love of God that gathers all sorts of people to the table of Christ. It's at that table, seated right next to all kinds of unlikely Christ followers, that we are cleansed and nourished and then sent out again to live the standards God expects from us. Live justly, love mercy, walk humbly with the God who has set a place at the table for everyone, even for you 
and even for me. Thanks, thanks be to God. Amen. The Psalter today comes from Psalm 98. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have given him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord, all the earth. With the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> oh God, on this morning we do, like the psalmist, shout for joy. We shout for joy for all the blessings you have provided. We shout for joy that you have gathered your people together once again to proclaim your, your mighty and your majestic works among all your peoples. On this holy, holy day, we come to you knowing that the world is still a bit in chaos, that though there is progress being made on many fronts, there are leaders trying to address problems. There are doctors researching and trying to get as many vaccines into arms so that our people, your people, can be back to normal or at least some sense of a, of a new normal. So God, when our hearts are weary, when our sights for the future seem in doubt, may we rest in you. May this moment of holy worship bring us together, not only in worship, but may it bring us together in care and love for one another. Sometimes I feel like the world too often looks left and looks right. Instead, we need to look up. We need to look up for our answers cometh from God who made heaven and earth. So instill in us as your congregation here at Five Thomas Circle, instill in us the leaders, the teachers, the servants, the staff, 
the musicians, and all who live and breathe the work of your kingdom, bless upon them this day. Stir them to realize their work is greater than just this address, that their work actually empowers your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. God, we pray that you would be with those ravaged by this earthly vaccine. We pray that those who have lost job, security, and family would once again feel your presence, feel your your Holy Spirit in a guidance and a in a real way. And in this moment of holy prayer, <clears throat> our God, through the name of Jesus Christ, forgive us, forgive us of our sins, restore to us the joy of our salvation. Help us realize that that there are no boundaries, there are no, no hindrances to your gospel. And oh, Holy Father, swing open wide the doors of holy, holy escape so that all may come to know the glory and wondrous news of resurrection through Jesus Christ, who taught the disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, we come today to the table of Jesus Christ. And as we've heard today from these challenging words from the book of Acts, this is a table that's welcome is wide. Everyone is welcome around this table, and it's our holy obligation and honor to set this table in such a way that everyone feels welcome. This is not the table of National City Christian Church. It is the table of Jesus Christ, and as such, everyone is welcome here. You are welcome here. As we've been doing during this time of COVID, we've been gathering the elements that we have at home and using whatever you have around, some juice, some water, some wine, and some bread, a cracker, whatever you have, uh, in order to participate in this ancient ritual even though we're separated physically. And it's a delight that Elder Gary is here to help bless these elements as we begin to explore what it looks like to come back to worship in person. And so now as we come to the table of Christ, let us give thanks for the bread and the cup. Heavenly Father, we gather together at this hour to partake of these elements representing the broken body of your son, Jesus Christ. This bread represents the body of Christ broken on the cross and this cup is spilled blood while on the cross. Eat of the bread and drink from the cup for the remission of your sins. So as we wait for the day when we can once again meet in joyous celebration as a family of faith, surround us, Heavenly Father, with your love that is comforting, protective, and sweet as the arms of our mothers. Amen and amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered for dinner with his disciples. They were his disciples, yes, but they were also his dearest friends, like his family. And like in every family, there were all kinds of characters. On that first meal, that first Holy Communion, everyone was represented around the table. The ones who were overachievers, the troublemakers, those that were holier than thou, the ones who just didn't really think they believed, there was space for everybody. And as Jesus looked out at them, as Jesus would look out at us, he picked up a piece of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. And lifting the cup, he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. And so today, followers of Jesus, skeptics, anyone who's here around this table, Take and eat as we do together. This is the gift of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Victorious Lord, we come to this time in our service to offer these gifts, our gifts, to be used in observance of your steadfast love. We give joyfully so that others may join our unending common voice of praise. May our giving be received as sweet smelling incense and as a faithful and tangible celebration of your love and grace. Thanks be to God. You can give your offering on Facebook by postal mailing your offering to National City or by using the Tithely app. Join us in our hymn of going forth. Yesu, Yesu. Thank you. 
your love show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you As our time of formal worship comes to a close, we're invited to go into the world with our eyes wide open looking for resurrection. That's not the easiest thing to do, as we saw today in the story of Simon Peter. Simon Peter thought he had everything right. He was working so hard to follow the rules, to do things just as they had always been done. And in doing so, he missed the signs of resurrection that were inviting him to open the doors wide to welcome everyone to the table of Christ. As you go into this week, open your eyes wide, look for resurrection in the most unlikely places, and respond when you find it. As our worship comes to a close, I invite you to pause for a few moments of silence and then receive this blessing. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God grant you peace today and forevermore. Amen.